I always enjoy the privilege of coming here to preach, and uh, your pastor has much more wisdom than I give him credit for. I mean, wow, the night of the stewardship banquet, and going ahead and having the power fall out. That's pretty good, brother. I like that. Man, I'm going to have to remember that. Matthew chapter 25 this evening, Matthew 25. And I've appreciated this church and the college, again, as he mentioned, for my first, my four older ones. The first four were all, we had them one after another, and then uh, there's a 10-year age difference between our two youngest. We thought we were done after four, and then about nine years later, we started praying about having one more, and we decided to have one more when we were in New Guinea. And so Levi is here and now dropping him off. So we are going to be officially empty nesters here with this taking place. So I cannot wait to get back and celebrate that. It's been, man, that's been a long time coming. And uh, Daniel was born in 1991, and now we're finally getting them all out of the house. So glad. That is such, such a... I'm going to be crying on the plane all the way back tomorrow. That's going to be taking place in reality. But Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to start, I'm going to start reading in verse number 14. Matthew 25, verse number 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. Likewise also he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received the five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gathered where I not straw. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For every one that hath shall be given, and, and, uh, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I certainly love you. Lord, I ask your blessing now upon the service this evening. Please, number one, help me to stay true to your word. Lord, please use me. Control what I say and how I say it. I pray that you would use your word tonight to be a help. Lord, to strengthen your people, to draw us closer to you. Lord, may we leave here with a greater fervency to glorify you, to honor you, and all that we have and all that you've given us. Please work tonight, Lord, I beg you. Father, I do pray if there's anyone here who has never truly been converted, I pray for that conviction and that drawing that perhaps even this evening they'd repent and place their faith in Christ. Again, Lord, I love you. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to still align one line from a very famous poem to start off with. Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. How often do we look back and think what might have been when it comes to life? 
What opportunities did I miss? Multitudes of Christians, when they enter into eternity, wondering what might have happened had I used the opportunities given to me. Wasting too often what God has given us, not being a faithful steward with what God has entrusted to us. The truth is, one of the most precious things that in any of us have is our time. You can never get that back. Even this evening, as the seconds are going by, you will never get this time back. We all recognize time goes so quick. I am 53 years old. It amazes me how fast time goes. I will never see 52 again or 51 again. The seconds as they go by, it's done. One of the most precious things you have is time. It is time that gives us the opportunity to use our life, our talent, what it is that God has put in our possession that we are stewards of. Time is important. For instance, you can have the best basketball player on your team loaded with talent, the best one on the court, but the truth is if the clock runs out, all the ability he has doesn't matter. The truth is also, with all the ability he has, and if he's on the bench, it doesn't matter. The potential is there, but what wasted opportunity. We certainly don't want to waste the opportunity we have in this life. This meeting, even tonight, this yearly time of thinking about stewardship and what God has given you and trying to plan and, and see what God has put before you is about, is about that planning and saying, listen, we don't want to waste the opportunity that God has given us of trying to stir you to remembrance. Look what you have. Look what's before us. You don't want to look back and say what might have been. We want to be faithful with the time God has given us. We want to be faithful with the opportunity that time presents us. We want to be faithful with the time that we have, the opportunity we have, and then with the life he's given us with whatever talent that is. In understanding the parable that I read tonight, we have to always keep it in proper context. The truth is, this discourse started, it's one of the last discourses before Christ uh, um, goes into the time of the Last Supper. They're already in Jerusalem, this is the last week of Christ's life. I'm sure you realize this, but the bulk of the gospel focuses on the very last week of Christ's life. And so they were out and with Christ, and Christ had been talking to them, and, 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 and the disciples had asked the question, when is the end? When is it coming? And it's part of this discourse that we are given. That is the setting of this parable. The one before this sort of ties in. It helps us give us understanding of what's taking place here. And that was the parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. You had five who were generally ready for the Lord's return. As they waited on the bridegroom, five were ready. Five looked like they were ready, but they were not. So that parable dealt with waiting before the Lord's return. This parable now deals with working before the Lord's return, of being a faithful steward with what God has given you. The truth is, we need to be able to do both. As we wait for the master's return, we must be ready and working. So tonight, as we go into this parable to try and be a help to Fairhaven Baptist Church, I want to break this down into a couple of different areas. We're going to look at the stewardship that was given to each of these servants. Then I want to look at the servants and their stewardship. And then basically, the, the, the last two I'm just going to combine into one here this evening. And that is the servants rewarded. So let me jump into this. Let's look at first the stewardship that is given, verses 14 and 15. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. The phrase that begins us here is the kingdom of heaven. 
It can be used to encompass a lot in Scripture. Don't pigeonhole that phrase. Context always determines the meaning of it, and that's how you ascribe what's coming with the, with the parable here. Whenever you see the mention of kingdom of heaven, one of two things is meant. Sometimes the term of kingdom of heaven is used for those who are simply in Christ. I can give you references right now that refer to just that. Other times, it refers to almost the scope of God's kingdom, including both lost and saved. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Matthew 18 3 dealing with just those in the kingdom except you be converted and become as little children you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven however you can look at Matthew 25 1 the, the beginning of uh, this first parable given uh, of the ten virgins five were wise five were foolish five were converted and five were not so it was dealing with lost and saved um, Matthew uh, 13 24 the wheat and the tares the same phrase is used Matthew 13 47 the fisherman and his net gathering every good kind the same phrase is used this helps us determine what the Lord is teaching us here in regards to our stewardship. So we have this man, this Lord, this master leaving for an undeclosed amount of time, and no one knows when he's going to return. He takes aside three of his servants, and he begins to distribute talents. Now, what is a talent? A talent is something that can weigh between 90 and 120 pounds. Think about that. In some cases, it was determined by what a man could lift. I could probably do about 300 myself, I think. <laughs> Why is that funny? Why does everybody laugh at that? No. When it came to currency, which is what is implied here, of course, this talent then would either be in gold or silver. So think about that. Think about what is being given. Regardless, just one talent, just one, would be a very large sum of money, six figures, just one. It is said that one talent was equal to 20 years worth of an average wage. So even the servant who was given one talent was given great responsibility. So he distributes based on ability, the text tells us. He gives one five, he gives another one two, and the last one, he gives one. And I'm sure we all understand that the master, the Lord here, represents the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are the servants. When it comes to talents, it's as if all of us hold a bag from the Lord of, of what he's given us, our abilities, our opportunities that we are stewards of. He has given you a life and opportunity. It matters how you use it. You are come, I hope you've already been praying about this for weeks or at least a week coming in this. Lord, what would you have me to do? If you have it, start praying throughout this. Please, Lord, just help me to follow you. He has given us, all of us, life and opportunity but not all of us have the same opportunity. There's some important principles here as we consider in relation to what's even taking place here tonight and what we see in this parable. One, God Almighty knows each of our abilities. He knows what each of us are capable of. He knows, what you can, he knows exactly what you can do. He knows we're all different. We have different intelligence, different strengths, different weaknesses. What God expects, expects of me, he does not expect of you. There are some here who have opportunities at, at, at much higher education. Some who have been taught different disciplines in life. You need to see your life as this talent that has been given to you by God. The things that have come about in your life circumstantially over the years are not by coincidence. especially for those of us that live in the United States of America, what great opportunity and privilege we have been given. And listen to me, we will be accountable for it. How much we just simply waste on needless things. And when I was in New Guinea, the understanding, of course, was limited. I began to realize the privilege I had of growing up in the United States, of having to take men and just to teach them how to read. Just like now, there are different people here as I preach who have different levels of understanding. I know for Brother Vogler and Brother Armacost, I need to keep the cookie jar low. 
I know they have trouble with understanding, so I'm trying to do my best. (laughs) See, the Lord knows who you are and what you're capable of. And within that realm, you have a God-given responsibility that one day you will be held accountable for. And you will see, God does not, this is important because us as independent feminine Baptists, we get this part backwards. God does not base one better than another based on greater opportunity. Never has. It's based on faithfulness with whatever opportunity you have been given. Who is the greatest born among women, Christ said? Who was it? John the Baptist. He, how many miracles did he do? Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? John did no miracle. What did he do? He simply fulfilled his potential. We need to see ourselves as stewards before God. One of the greatest areas of opportunity we have been given, of course, is that of the gospel itself. And think about this. You're in such a unique position here at Fairhaven Baptist Church. More so than the vast majority of all of our churches in the world You have been given a great talent, if you will. You have Fairhaven Baptist College right here. You have an opportunity, a stewardship that's been handed to you by your Lord. Be faithful to it. Listen, teachers, as the the semester's starting, understand the privilege you have, the opportunity you have. When you stand before those students, please, especially if you've been teaching for years, don't lose the passion for it. I have a son here. He needs somebody to, something that's going to teach it with passion and understands the responsibility you have been given by God. You are instructing things concerning the word of God and his service. You have a stewardship with it. You've been given opportunity and talent. You're not here by accident. Be faithful with what you have been given. Secondly, Let's look at how each of these servants responded to the stewardship. So the servants and their stewardship. The one with five, of course, was faithful, and he doubled what he had. So he was probably given somewhere in the neighborhood of four hundred dollars to $500,000 in equivalents, and he doubled it. The same one who had two doubled it as well. Let's think about those faithful ones for a second. Let's talk about them. As we see by the, when, the, when the Lord came and, and was commending them for all that they had did, they were faithful. They were wise stewards of what God had given them. They saw what they were given, and the Lord knew they could do this. He knew their ability. There was a reason he assigned it. So listen, I know you can do this. I've selected you three for a reason. You can handle this. You can do this. Listen, those of you who are here at the college and maybe it's your first year, you're heading into your last year or whatever, you're here for a reason. It's not an accident. Again, it's not because mom and dad sent you here. God is in control. You have a responsibility of what is given before you. Those servants, when that responsibility and that privilege was given to them when they were handed this. I mean, think, even the guy who's handed one talent, that was 20 years worth of an average wage. What a privilege was given. Now, the two faithful, oh, they were so thankful. They wanted to, they set out with the mindset of, I want to show our Lord that I appreciate this. I want to show him that what he has entrusted me, I will be faithful with. I want him to be pleased when he returns. They were thankful. They, didn't look at, at, they did not look at what had been given them for something to show off or to use in an inappropriate way. They simply wanted to honor the Lord who had entrusted them. You have to look at what God has given you, wh- whether that's your finances, the time you have, uh, whatever, however that in, whatever is encompassed in your life as the responsibility that you have to say, Lord, thank you. Lord, I want to show you that I will be faithful with this. To double 
For that to take place, I'll tell you what they did immediately. They went to work. They went to work. They did not procrastinate. They did not procrastinate at all. That kills the opportunity of so many people and so many Christians as they just delay. I'll, I'll start tomorrow. I'll start serving. Uh, I, you know, next year I'll be in a better position. We all know tomorrow never comes. You will always find a reason not to be faithful. There will always be something. You just simply trust the Lord. Say, Lord, please show me what I need to do and I'll be faithful. Amen. Honor God. They avoided laziness. Now get this. There is no question in my mind. These were, these were simply servants. And they doubled what was given to them. How did they learn how to do that? I think there's only one answer to that question. They learned from their Lord. They saw how wise he was. They were close to him. They watched his business dealings. They saw how he managed his finances. What they did was they learned from their Lord. If you're going to be faithful with what God has given you, you have to stay close to the master. You have to learn from him so you have the wisdom to use what God has given you so it's not wasted. The fact that they doubled it teaches us they did not get sidetracked. Boy, does this not happen to us all at times. As time and weeks go by, just like the Lord here was gone a long time, sometimes you can get sidetracked. Something else starts using your talent. I can think of different times in my life where, where th different things popped up to try and sidetrack sidetrack me from what God had intended for me. Or too often, we're too busy waiting for the perfect conditions. That'll never happen. The faithful servants did not waste the opportunity that was given to them. Avoid those things that can come up and remove the opportunity that God has put in your hand because that happens to multitudes. Demas comes to mind, forsaking Paul, having loved this present world. What an opportunity that man had. He is with that is in my mind the greatest Christian who ever lived. For a time period, faithfully serving with him, but something got him sidetracked. Something took away the opportunity he had possessed. Listen, don't get, don't get so caught up in the things of this world. I preached through a couple of, I guess I finished it about two years ago. I, I, I preached through the book of Ecclesiastes. I, and that's pretty much all I do is I just preach through books of the Bible. And I preached through Ecclesiastes, and man, was that such a challenge and a help to me. Here you have, uh, again, God's sovereignty always amazes me. Here you have a man put in a position by God, qualified as no other, to come to the conclusion, anything else but God is a waste. He had all the financial power anybody could want. He had all the, all the authority and power he wanted as a king anybody could want. He sought it in pleasure. He, I mean, you name it, he sought it. And his whole conclusion, it's all vanity apart from God. Amen. What you have been given, understand this, apart from God, it is vanity. When you stand before your Lord, you're going to realize, what have I done? What have I wasted? The third servant, this guy goes and buries it. Now, that was actually common in the day. That was almost your safe of the day. It would protect it from thieves. You would go and you would bury your treasure somewhere, whatever wealth you had. It was common to bury it. So he follows that, and that's what he does. I saw that in P&G. I remember a guy had led to the Lord. It was, he was older. A couple years later, he was dying of malaria. And it was the first time I came across that. And he's telling me this location by a tree I need to go dig up. Because that's where he had kept whatever money he had. He had it buried sitting there. Well, that's what this servant does. He just takes it and he goes and buries it. He was unwise and he was slothful. The truth is, he simply wasn't dedicated. He didn't want to put the work in to do it. He had other things he wanted to accomplish. He didn't want to worry about making money for his Lord. I got other things I want to do right now. I'm just going to bury this thing. 
I'll come back and talk more about him in a minute as I come into when I get to his punishment. So let's move on to the last point, the servants and their reward. Now, because the two servants were faithful, you can think of all the excitement they had when they heard the master's back. I mean, you can just see it. He's back. I mean, you could see the one who had five. He knows. You better believe he was tracking that. He could not wait till he could show the master that what you entrusted to me, I was faithful with. Look, look, look what's been accomplished. I have doubled it. It's doubled. There was no anxiety with him. I mean, he could not wait. How peaceful it is when we are serving the Lord with our whole heart. How when you can go to bed at night and rest, and just rest. Paul himself even talked of having boldness in the day of judgment. When you are a wise steward with what God has given you, that's the only way you're going to have any measure of boldness in the day of judgment. Much of what you're determining life is determining one element of that. Are you going to see yourself as a steward before God and the responsibility that you all happen to have, which is unique at Fairhaven Baptist Church? And I am thankful for it. You can tell. I mean, I, I, I benefited from this church's giving as a missionary and both with cost with my children coming through here. Rewards will be given as a result of that. Now, the commendation for both the one who had five and two, of course, was the same. They are both praised the same, both taken from a position of a servant to that of a ruler. What the Lord was basing their reward on was their faithfulness according to opportunity and ability. That's how you'll be judged of God. It's not going to be judged on a dollar amount or a time amount. It's going to be judged on, I know who you were, what responsibilities you had in life, I, 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 I know what you were faithful with and what you were not faithful with. Based on ability and opportunity, he will judge you. <clears throat> and again, they went from servants to rulers. There's much I can go into that, but I, I won't do that. I believe there's many principles in the Bible that do, that do decide what happens it, based on our reward when we do stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and positions that will be given out for eternity. But now, let's look at the judgment of the fourth servant. I want to read again what he said. I want you to notice this. Look at verse 24 and 25. Then... He which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sowed, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. He didn't even dig it up. My goodness. So now let's look at the judgment of this guy. First off, he speaks ill of his Lord. He speaks against him. I mean, look at what he said. I know thou art hard, reaping where thou hast uh, not sowed, and gathering where thou hast not strawn. What he is calling in him here right to his face is a thief. I know you're a hard man. Follow me. Watch where I'm going here. This demonstrates this servant's heart and character. He said basically to this Lord, you are unmerciful, you lack compassion, you're too hard, you're too demanding, you're not kind, you're not gracious. Does this even sound like that he knows this Lord? He does not. He does not. He doesn't understand him at all. He does not know this Lord for who he really is. Is it not a shame for so many people are just like this before God? Religion's just too hard. God is just too demanding. They never see the goodness and the graciousness, the long suffering, the mercy of just how great and good God is. They view him as harsh and hard and unjust. And how you view God affects how you serve God. 
Because this servant had the wrong mindset of his Lord, it affected his faithfulness with what was given to him. The Lord's response to him, you wicked and slothful servant. You see, that was the real problem. The real problem was very different than what that servant just said. The real problem was the character of the man, not the character of the Lord. It's almost here as if the Lord mocks him in his return. Oh, so you think you know me. Is this so? If it's true, then why did you not put the money to the exchangers where I could at least receive interest? What he's talking about, the, the Roman banking system of this time was fairly interesting. He could have taken that to the equivalent of a Roman bank uh, to be put out for a loan for somebody else that needed it. And the average interest rate at this time, how they would do it, was actually 12%. And the person who provided the funds, so this servant, he could have received 6% back because the bank there, that Roman bank would keep 6% and 6% would go to the person who provided the funds. Would that not be nice if our banks did that today? That's a whole other sermon. Probably not too biblical, but I'll stay with my text. <clears throat> this is a man, though, that is clearly evident he did not really know his Lord. He looked just like the others, though, didn't he? Just like the ten virgins. From the outside, you probably really couldn't tell. Wasn't much different. They looked the same. But only two, they were so excited at recognizing the goodness of the Lord and what he had given them. Why the other one viewed the Lord as a hard, unjust man. He looked like the others, but boy, was he very different in the heart. We see what is done to him. He is cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, this seals it. There's some controversy or the interpretation of it. It's simple. This was a lost man. Let me finish this evening with this famous quote. It's, I'm trying to remember my history of this quote now. It's over a thousand years old, if I remember right right now. Let, let me give this quote in conclusion. Remember that when you leave this earth, you can take nothing that you have received, only what you have given. Each one of us, the moment we got saved, we became a steward of the life given to us by God. 